This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Plato. I'm saddened with the news this week that Dr. Jane Goodall has passed away at 91. Now I could recount for you her credentials and awards, but you're going to read a lot of obits about Jane Goodall. So I want to tell you about the Jane Goodall I grew to know and admire over the decades I interviewed her. Jane Goodall had guts. She never took no for an answer. She went into the jungles of the Gambi Forest in Tanzania with no formal training as a scientist, inventing observation techniques and methods others would use later, invent them as she went along. That's how talented and determined she was. When she saw the environment that she had grown to love under attack, she didn't wait for others to lead. She went headlong like she had into the jungle and fought back, becoming a tireless advocate for conservation. Accumulating kudos, credits, and awards along the way, even becoming Dame Jane, she knew those accolades would help her cred when she spread her message. Dame Jane embodied the meticulous precision of a scientist and the deep compassion of a humanitarian. She emphasized the importance of hope for survival. Her legacy of discovery, preservation, and empathy continues to shape global conservation efforts and inspire action. I was fortunate to have our paths cross numerous times, the last being her 90th birthday celebration in New York last year. So on a sad day like today, I thought it would be comforting to be reminded of the boundless, positive, welcoming spirit she carried. You're going to hear it in our conversation from 2002. We talked about her first entry into the world of the chimps, her many discoveries, and her hopes for a better future. Thank you very much for coming in to join us today. Oh, thanks on. for inviting me. Let's talk a little bit about uh, your background. Um, Gilbert uh, Grosvenor, chairman of the National Geographic Society, once wrote about you in one of your books. She was hardly the image one would project to become an old African hand. Her bush experiences <laughs> were honed in the genteel English countryside. Well, it wasn't exactly genteel. I wouldn't have described it like that. But, you know, animals were my passion from even before I could speak, apparently. So I was watching earthworms in, in my bed when I was one and a half. And I hid for five hours in a hen house when we had the opportunity to go into the country because we lived in the town because I was collecting the eggs. And, you know, there was the egg. Where was the hole big enough for the egg to come out? Nobody told me. So I hid. <laughs> you, wanted, and, you wanted to watch it. And I watched it. And it was my first, you know, wonderful experiment. And then when I was about 10, 11, I found the books about Tarzan of the apes, fell in love with Tarzan. He's got that wife, Jane, you know, so I was terribly jealous of her. And that was when my dream started. When I grew up, I would go to Africa, live with animals and write books about them. That's how it all began. And how did you fulfill that dream? Well, I got the opportunity when a school friend invited me to go and stay on their farm in Kenya. And I was working at the time with Documentary Film Studio in London, which is a great job, didn't pay very much. So I quit that, went home and worked as a waitress and served people there breakfast, lunch, tea and dinner until I'd saved up enough money to buy my return fare by boat because it was cheapest in those days. So, you know, I was 23 and I sort of said bye-bye to family, friends and country and off I went. But we had arranged a job for me in Nairobi, a boring job, a secretarial job, but at least I would be independent. And that was when I heard about the late Lewis Leakey. And somebody said, Jane, if you're interested in animals, you must meet Lewis. So I picked up the telephone, cheeky me, and made an appointment to go and see Lewis Leakey. He was then curator of the Natural History Museum in, in Nairobi. And were, were you around then when he made that famous discovery? No, I was the year before. It was the year before. Oh, just missed Which out. was so lucky. It was because, lucky. Yes, because it was absolutely unknown. We just spent all day chipping away in the in the rock. And then Gillian and I were allowed out on the plains. And all the animals were there, the antelopes, the zebra, the giraffes. And then one evening there was a rhino, which was a little bit scary. And one evening, a, a young male lion, two years old, totally curious, never seen anything like me and Gillian before. And he followed us for at least, well, a couple of football pitches. It was like being at home. Hmm. And so then how did you find your way toward working with the, the chimps? Well, it was during that old of I time that Lewis realized that I was the sort of person he said he'd been looking for for about 10 years. So he made this suggestion to me. It took him a year 
to get the money. I mean, who was going to give money to a, a young girl, a female, who didn't have a degree of any sort, straight out from England? I mean, what a ridiculous idea. So I was in England waiting, learning what I could about chimpanzees while he searched for money and eventually found a wealthy American businessman. Said, okay, Lewis, here you are. Here's enough money for six months. We'll see how she does. And you did pretty well. Well, it was a very, very worrying time because I got to Gombe. Again, I felt I was at home. But the chimpanzees ran away as soon as they saw me. You know, they're very conservative. They'd not seen a white ape before. And I knew if that six months money ran out before I'd seen something really exciting, you know, I would have let Lewis down. Well, we told you so. This is ridiculous. But fortunately, just before that time came, I saw the first observations of using and making tools. And that was the saving observation, the breakthrough. Of course, at that time, you know, we were defined as man the toolmaker. That right. was supposed to differentiate us more than anything else in the rest of the animal kingdom. David Greybeard, bless his heart, um, I saw him crouched over a termite mound. Couldn't really see properly. They were still not very relaxed in my presence. I was hiding, and but I knew he was using a piece of grass. And a few days later, he and one of the other chimps, I could see them much better. The whole thing, putting in the grass, picking the termites off, picking a leafy twig and stripping off the leaves, which is the beginning of tool making. So that was it. Exciting. It was, I couldn't actually believe it. I had to see it about four times before I let Lewis Leakey know. And then I sent a telegram and he sent back his famous comment, ha ha, now we must redefine man, redefine tool, or accept chimpanzees as humans. <laughs> Well, now, I know you do wonderful chimp calls. I'm going to try to get my engineer ready for this because Jane tells me it's pretty <laughs> loud. So tell us what call you're going to be giving. Well, I'm going to do the greeting, and it's the kind of sound you'd hear if you went to Gombe and you climbed up onto the ridge in the morning and you listened. And if you're lucky, you hear the chimpanzee who's calling out saying, here I am, it's a wonderful day, where are you? And, Wow. Each one has his or her own individual voice. So you know exactly who's calling. So like we can tell on the phone who the chimp is, you can also tell. Yes, correct. You were, I want to pick up on the you having to get a PhD. You went back and they were just aghast at you. Yeah, they it's were. Whippersnapper. That's yeah. upstart. Yeah, it was even accused of teaching the chimps how to fish for termites, which, I mean, that would have been such a brilliant coup. <laughs> Besides your initial discovery, what has been most surprising? Well, the most surprising and, and shocking, really, was when in 1970, that's after 10 years of research, we realized that chimpanzees have a dark side, just like we. I thought they were so like us, but rather nicer. And then to find that they are capable of brutality, that they may even have uh, a series of events not unlike primitive warfare, that they can attack members of another social group so severely that those individuals um, die as a result of their wounds and that infants can be killed. And mm. that was very, very shocking. Mm -hmm. And any, uh, why it took 10 years, about 10 years to discover that? Well, because the boundary patrols are right out at the far end of their range. And I suppose we just weren't following them far enough. But also the warlike, you know, we called it the four-year war, mm -hmm. that was a rather specific circumstance. And it was when our main study community divided. And when those two groups had sort of completely separated, then the males of the larger group began to systematically annihilate the split-off individuals. So it was almost like a civil war. And it was, it was very, very shocking. Let's go to uh, Sharif in Philadelphia. Hi. How are you doing? Um, I wanted to know if you believe there are any undiscovered large ape species, and if you believe that the bonobo chimpanzee is a subspecies of the chimp or a separate species. Okay, well, I'll do the second one first because that's easy. It's definitely a, another species. I mean, it's known. It's described as another species. It's a bonobo, not a pygmy chimpanzee. Different in many, many ways. What a wild species that is. I mean, just incredible. Yeah. Right? Rich yeah. species. Very, things, the very... things that they do that we never thought. That's right. The chimps do. Yes. Chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans genetically are equidistant. 
As for the other, you're talking about Yeti or Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Is that what he's talking about? Yes, yes, he is. <laughs> is, that the, and is that the message I'm missing here? <laughs> I think that's the message you're missing. Is that well, right, Sherry? Uh, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you'll be amazed when I tell you that I'm, I'm sure that they exist. You, you are. Yeah. I've talked to so many Native Americans who've all described the same sounds, two who've seen them. I've probably got about... 30 books that have come from different parts of the world from all over the place. And there was a little tiny uh, snippet in the newspaper just last week, which says that British scientists have found what they believe to be a Yeti hare, and that the um, scientists in the Natural History Museum in London couldn't identify it as any known animal. Wow. Now, that was just a wee bit in the in the newspaper, and obviously we have to hear a little bit more about From this that. age of DNA, if you find a hare, there might be some cells on it. Right. Well, there will be, and there I'm sure be. that's what they've examined. My little tiny snippet said that don't match up with DNA cells from known animals, so apes. <laughs> Did you always have this belief that, they're, that, they, that they existed? Well, I'm a romantic, so I always wanted them to exist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sherry. Thank you. Thanks for calling. How do you go looking for them? I mean, people have been looking, or has this just been, since we don't really believe they could exist, we really haven't really made a serious Well, there are people them. looking. There's, a, there's very... Um, ardent groups in mm -hmm. Russia, and they have published a whole lot of stuff about what they've seen. Of course, the big, the big um, criticism of all this is where is the body? You know, why isn't there a body? And I can't answer that. And maybe they don't exist. Mm -hmm. But I want them to, and, and so I... I... <laughs> what needs to be researched out there? I mean, what is missing from the picture? Well, one of the most fascinating areas for research is cultural differences between different populations across Africa or even different neighboring communities. And of course, it's still controversial as to whether chimpanzees can have culture. But I define it very simply as behavior that's passed from one generation to the next through observation, imitation and practice. And tool using behaviors differ quite markedly across the species range in mm. Africa. Now, we've just begun to skim the surface of these differences. But even as you and I are speaking, chimpanzee, chimpanzees along with their cultures are being wiped out right across Africa. So from about 2 million 100 years ago to the very maximum 200,000 today. And that's wow. more likely to be 150,000, mostly in tiny, isolated fragments where there's no possibility for long-term survival because the gene pools aren't big enough. And they're dying? Why? They're dying because of habitat destruction as human populations grow. They're caught in wire snares set for other animals, but they catch the chimps and gorillas for that matter. And they either die of gangrene or lose a hand or foot and can't compete very well reproductively. But the worst threat for chimps today is the commercial bushmeat trade. And that is the hunting of animals for, for sale in the big towns, not, not subsistence hunting, which has gone on for hundreds and hundreds of years. But this has happened because the logging companies have made roads into the heart of the last great forests of the Congo Basin. Hunters go along the trail. They now have transport. They shoot everything. They load it on the truck. They take it to the towns, where the elite will pay more for it than chicken or goat. No kidding. Do you see yourself as an effective spokesperson for the environment now? There are so few people. One of the remarks that's so often said to me after a lecture People come up and they say, you have re-inspired me to do my bit. You have made me feel that my own life is more worthwhile. Do you, but do you think that people who might be tougher to reach with that message might be more inclined to invite a Jane Goodall to speak or listen to you as someone who was, quote-unquote, a political environmentalist? Well, I do know that when talking to people who perhaps think very differently, the only chance you have of getting them to think in a different way is to touch the heart. And if you're strident, if you start accusing people, if you point fingers, then you immediately see the eyes glaze over and you know that you're not getting across. And, you know, I have to go around and think that so much of what goes on that, in my view anyway, is a mistake, is due 
not to any kind of criminal intent, but simply because people honestly haven't understood. So I feel that that's my job. My job is to help people understand and to think about the future. I mean, if just imagine what this world would be like if we went back to the old tradition of the Native Americans who said every major decision has to be made with the question, how will this affect our people seven generations on? Hmm. Uh, even if we could just say two generations on, even one generation on, it would be helpful. Yeah. Do you miss do you miss though the forest? I try and keep the forest in me. That that's what I have to do to remain sane. But when I do go back to Gombe, you know, it's to be out in the forest, even without a chimpanzee, to be in that timeless world where it's soft and where life is entwined and you actually see the pattern of nature. And I always feel this great spiritual power which I believe is is around. It must rejuvenate you. It does, absolutely. What the uh... What do you want to be remembered for? I think I'd, I'd like to be remembered as someone who really helped people to have a little humility and realize that we are part of the animal kingdom, not separated from it. The, the various results from chimpanzee research has done a lot to soften scientific attitude. And then about my um, work for the environment, let's wait till I'm dead and see what sort of impact <laughs> I've had, and then, then I can tell you. And so you're going to continue to travel? I have to, well, as long as I can. Because? Because it's making a difference. Because I can see the result of, of a visit like to mainland China. The, the Minister of the Environment said, Dr. Goodall, I would like your programs in our schools. And it, it's changing the attitude of children to animals. So in your quiet way, I mean, you're, you're sort of in the background until we, an IMAX movie or something comes out, but you're still working very hard. I've, I'm working harder now than I ever worked. This is much harder work than crawling through the forest after the chimps. That was just bliss, exhausting physically, bliss. This is, you know, every day and you take it, you live it day by day. That's the only way to get through it. Well, good luck to you. Thank you. Dr. Jane Goodall, from a conversation in 2002. Condolences to all those whose life she has touched. <laughs>